take over if you want. Hi, JJ is coming right back. He is actually right here. <laughs> hey, new spot. Can you hear me? Okay. Sounds good. Um, where's the volume on yours? I can't hear David now. Oh, you okay. can't hear me? Oh, yeah. Now we can. Usually right. I'm nice Thank and you. loud. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> this was just a nice little uh, one minute start to make sure everyone joined us in time uh, as my audio failed right when we came on, of course. But we're here and we're glad to have you. Welcome to Winter College uh, 2024. We are so pleased to be joined today by David Iman, who is a uh, a professor in the Farmer School of Business, and he is also the FSB Director of Innovation, which is a very cool title and job. And he's going to kick off our week of events with a very exciting um, creativity uh, seminar uh, uh, exercise, I guess you would call it. And so we hope you're ready for that. And we uh, are really excited for you to be joining us and maybe the rest of the week, too. We have events all week at noon, including a wine tasting tonight also and uh, some things Friday for Charter Day. So, David, we still need your slides to be shared. And uh, then I think we are in good shape and I'll turn it over to you uh, after that. Well, I think you just tell me if you're seeing uh, my slides. Are you seeing they my slides? They are coming up and now they're full screen. So Excellent. we are in business. I think. Excellent, thank you so much. I appreciate your, your intro. I'll introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, but if I, if you would, please, everybody who's out there listening, if you could grab a piece of paper, well, maybe two or three little scraps of paper and something to write with, you'll be doing some exercises later because basically everything I do is done through exercises. So uh, so thank you for joining me. David, uh, as David, sorry to jump in. One last thing before you go, if you could just hit hide on your little stream yard is sharing your screen thing. So that comes off the broadcast. And I think, uh, uh, oh, shoot. Am I there? Yes, you're back. Okay, great. We're good. Okay, awesome. Uh, so as I was saying, if you would please have something to write with, and I'll give you a quick introduction to myself. Uh, David Iman, I teach, actually I have a couple of jobs. I'm down to two jobs. I've been at Miami University for eight years now, and I've loved absolutely every single day of it. And they don't pay me to say that. I'm not an alum, but I fell in love with this place the minute I walked on campus, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything at this point. Uh, before that, I had a boutique industrial design company. We designed stuff that you would buy, like at Target and those kind of things, anything from surgical equipment that you would buy through commercial, you know, for doctors, uh, all the way through toys and games and that sort of thing. Uh, after that, I did some other work with, it, with creativity, and I, I've had many different careers, all of which amount to the same thing, which is why I teach creativity and innovation. So I teach in the Farmer School of Business, but I also teach in the First Year Integrated Core, which uh, there is a course that teaches entrepreneurial thinking and innovation thinking skills. And that is uh, that is my the bulk of what I do at Miami. So uh, so with that, I'm, we're going to share some things with you today. I'm going to share some exercises with you that I have been uh, working on through my classes, some things that I think uh, might help and we can share a smile together. You can learn something and, and that's about what it is. So as I said, uh, today, my goals are very simple, exercising mindsets of creativity that lead to driving innovations and sharing a smile while you learn a few things about creativity and about applied imagination. So those are the, those are the words uh, that I want to use for it today. Before I get moving though, I have several things that I want to share with you because, you know, it's worth a few minutes of good news to take, uh, just take a minute to brag. Uh, and, and it is bragging because I think we have a lot to brag about at Miami University. And I'm going to share a few things with you. We are for the 16th consecutive year. We are in a top 10 entrepreneurship school. Uh, we are num ranked this year. We are ranked number seven globally by the Princeton Review. We are a NASDAQ Center of Entrepreneurial Excellence, and this is the big one. We are a Model Entrepreneurship Program Award, and I have to be, uh, I have to be really good about that one. Uh, honestly, we beat out every uh, Ivy League school for that award, so really huge things. Uh, one more thing to brag about here is 820 Miami alumni and startup and business ecosystem professionals serve as mentors, coaches, judges, and as hosts for student internships. So if you have any of those things, have an interest in any of those things, please reach out to me. I'm always happy to put uh, 825 or, or, or 900 uh, people on that list. So thank you. Um, also, we brag about uh, the number of 
startups, the number of companies that have been built by alumni of Miami University, uh, ranging from coast to coast and everywhere in between, not just in our playgrounds. And we normally think of our playgrounds as uh, San Francisco, Chicago, uh, you know, and then the the Midwest area, but there's a whole lot more to it. And I, I think we should all be proud of that. One more thing that I really would like to brag about is uh, something that I have been working on for the last three years. It's called the Innovation Factory. You can look for, the, it is out right now, but you can look for a substantial increase to the size of this thing over the next two or three months. And basically this is a section of our Miami website that serves to celebrate the innovation that's happening inside a farmer school of business. Uh, it serves because a lot of times we've been out there talking about how great the teachers are and how great we do things. And then uh, people say, well, wh how, what, like what? And this, this will give you some insights as to what interesting things we are doing at Farmer School of Business. And my hope is that we can grow this and keep growing. Also, it has a place where you can get involved. So send me an email. If we, if you need anything or you want to do anything with it, please send me an email. So next up, I want to talk a little bit about why we do this work, because uh, it, it, it always comes up. Like, why do we do that? Why do we spend so much time on this word creativity? And why do we spend so much time on entrepreneurial thinking and, and innovation thinking? And uh, I will show you a little bit about that. I think it would be very easy for me to tell you uh, the, the truth about this. Number one skill that hiring parties, and especially in leadership positions, hiring parties and recruiters are looking for the number one thinking skill since 2010 has been creativity. And I think for that alone, it serves that we should do things. And I also, I have um, everybody from Dr. Crawford uh, down to the people I work with to thank for this because we really do get to do what we do well and we really do get to train students in some of the skills and the thinking skills that lead them to innovation thinking and applying their imagination imagination to things. Um, I like to look at this more than just what, what our recruiters are looking for. I like to look at this as how we develop young professionals. We get people, you know, they're, they're freshman year, and that seems to be where I've fallen as a specialist in helping freshmen get accustomed to the professional world. Uh, but I look at creativity skills as how we build more interested and interesting people. And we do that through creative and entrepreneurial thinking and by uh, allowing them or helping them to learn some of the skills of thinking skills that uh, lead to at creating advantages for their companies like empathy, curiosity, confidence, and taking risks and being resilient when things don't work out. So those are a few of the things that we teach in our courses. And I'm going to share a few of those things with you today. But I really am uh, proud that we are allowed to do that. We are able to do that. And it's celebrated from uh, from the minute students walk in the door until the recruiters uh, see it in real life. So rather than tell you all about this, I want to do a little experiment. And this is one of my favorite uh, experiment, my favorite exercises from the class. Uh, what I'd like you to do right now is take a little piece of scrap paper. Mine looks like this, but I want you to take a little piece of scrap paper because what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to build either your job or your new company. Mine my new company is going to look like this. This is my new company right here. It's this piece of paper crumpled up like this represents my company. In in some people's cases, this might rec represent your job. And, um, and I want you to build that because in a minute, don't do it yet, but I'm going to ask you to hit this target right dead center. And what, what I want to do, I'm going to show you that again, and I'm going to ask you to do that. So I'm going to count down three, two, one, and then you throw it at that target. And why we do this, like, I want to show you how business really works in real world. And, and I love this because it, it, it embodies everything that we do. Um, so this, by the way, as a startup for me, this represents that I am building a company or that I'm doing my job and I have borrowed every single penny that my entire family has. And I want you to look at it, that this would be the success or failure of you at your job or the success or failure of you at your business. And the rule of this thing is you stand back a little bit and I want you to throw it at the screen when I show you that. I'm going to count three, two, one, and then you throw it. And if it hits dead center on that target, you are wildly successful at work. And if it misses even by a little bit, like if it just misses a little bit, uh, you are completely out of business and a complete failure. And this what I love this exercise because it really does show you uh, how the work world works. So I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to count three, two, one, and then you throw it. If you're ready, three, two, one, go ahead and throw it. Now, my hope is uh, my hope is some of you 
still through it, but not every everybody still throws it. Uh, what just happened here is that it, it's played just like business. The thing about business is the rules don't change, but the game changes all the time. And when the game changes, we call that disruption in the in industry. It's almost like, well, okay, so we're all prepared to do something. And we're all prepared that everything is going to go the way we want it to, and then it doesn't. What I want you to see about this, though, is what's left is creativity, and that's why this is so important. I have a great example. Uh, in May of 2007, there were four companies that owned, I mean, dominated the world of telecommunications. It was Motorola, BlackBerry, Palm, and Nokia, and they owned one, almost 100%. Actually, it was close to 90-something percent and 90-something percent of the telecom industry. Um, and the thing about these is those four companies had billions of dollars worth of inventory, not millions, but billions of dollars. And they were making final assembly for those four phones that you're looking at right now. They were making them in final assembly in eight different countries, and they were buying parts from 16 different countries. They were doing final assembly. They were packing them, putting them in boxes, putting them in crates, putting them on trains, moving them to port, putting them into uh, ocean containers and, and shipping across the ocean. They had inventory in boats, and they had an inventory on trains, inventory in factories, inventory in warehouses, and literally people stood in line to wait to buy those until... June 29th in 2007, when Steve Jobs, who you're looking at on the left there, took the stage outside of San Francisco, and he called himself a press conference. And at that press conference, he, he said, um, and you can watch this on YouTube. It's a fun watch. It takes five minutes to watch this. It's really actually really cool. But he says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to change the course of telecommunications for the rest of the time, and I'd like you to meet the iPhone. And out of his pocket, he pulled the iPhone 1. The the thing about that is, if you were in the position of Motorola, BlackBerry, Palm, or Nokia, all of a sudden, your billions of dollars worth of inventory and all of the work that you were enjoying became worth nothing. Because everyone who stood in line waiting to buy that Palm, like I did, got out of line over at the Palm store and walked over to the Apple store and said, you know, I kind of want one of these Apple iPhones because this looks amazing. Uh, so what happened there is disruption, and what's left is creativity. That's all that's left. And it, it has been said, um, I forget who coined the, the term, um, creativity is the only legal advantage you can have over your competitors, and that's what people were left with in the, mo in the moment of telecommunication. And Apple introducing the iPhone is no different than me moving the target off of the screen. All of a sudden, you can't hit the target anymore because the market changed. Something changed in the market. And what you're left with is creativity. And the creative skill in this one was still throw the ball. And if it kind of hit the target off to the side, you were at least being creative about it. So our minds can work in that way. And I'm going to show you some building some neural pathways that will uh, that will help you to be more creative on the fly and build yourself the advantages, whether it's in life and uh, in business. I might as well say that because all of the work that I do, and I love this, all the work doesn't just pertain to work. It pertains as much to personal, uh, interpersonal experiences as well, and interpersonal relationships. So the big buzzword, creativity, what is that and why is it so great? So I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you how creativity works right now. And what I want you to do is, I'd like you to come up with a word or two that describes the taste of water. And if you would please, just type those words right into the uh, the chat window. If you have a chat window open, I would love you to type it in there. And if not, just kind of think of them to yourself. Just think for a second. Describe the taste of water in a word, maybe two words. I'll give you a second to think about that because it's really hard to do. Normally, people sit at tables, and when I have table teams work on this, they argue about it for 10 minutes, and, and then they come in with words like, um, you know, crisp or refreshing, and, and, and we have a good uh, discussion about that. So with those words, um, I want to show you how creativity works, because almost always the words are crisp, refreshing. Uh, they are words that are um, air, n no flavor. They are words that are not flavors, but they describe the taste of water personally perfectly. Some people say minerally, some people say, you know, uh, plasticky, some people say all kinds of things. All of those words are fantastic creative words, 
but they don't necessarily do the job of describing the taste of water because our taste buds are not built to register water and it's impossible to do. So I'm gonna show you with that exercise, I actually want you to see that exercise as how creativity works because it ex explains what happens in, in brain and neural, neural processing uh, to make creativity happen. So if you picture, I'd like you just for a minute to picture your brain as a warehouse full of knowledge. And in this warehouse, like if you're in your brain, you have this warehouse and you go into the warehouse and every single thing that you've ever learned, you've ever said, you've ever experiences, feelings, emotions, everything is neatly arranged in beautiful little boxes with you know the Dewey Decimal System of, of uh, registration where you can easily find things. That's what happens in your brain. You have storehouses of knowledge. And here's what happens. I say, describe the taste of water, and you run into your warehouse because we're all trained that we want to answer these questions fast. So you run into the warehouse as fast as you can, and you run down the aisle where flavors would be, and you open up the box, and you look in the box to look for the flavors, and you're like, hmm, salty, sweet. No, it's not that. It's not sweet. It's not savory. It's not umami. It's not spicy. It's not hot. And you kind of stand up. You scratch your head because you didn't find anything. And then you go, you start like wandering through aisles and you come across this aisle called feelings. And in one of those boxes, you find the word refreshing. Okay. And you're satisfied that that's an interesting word that describes the taste of water. So you run out of the warehouse and you share it with the world. You say refreshing. Uh, and what that is, is creative confidence. Because what you've done in your brain is you have made a delightful, unexpected connection between a word that describes something and the taste of water. And it works. And it works beautifully every single time. So some of these words are so creative. And I love these words like refreshing and wispy and wet and crisp and clean. And I love all those words because they are creative words. But do they describe the taste of water? Yes, but no. H2O technically doesn't have a flavor. So it's, it's, um, it is a creative way. And I love that because what well, the other thing it proves is every person by birthright, humans are creative. They were born so, and they can be creative on demand anytime, any day. Uh, one thing that I, uh, there was a study done, and, and I like this because it shows that neural conditioning actually works. Over time, if we do things like running into our warehouse and making unexpected connections, over time, it actually changes the physical nature of our brain. It builds neural pathways that stick around for a long time. That's why creativity is trainable and improvable over time. Uh, this study was done before Uber came along. There were taxi drivers, and before GPS came along, taxi drivers and bus drivers. And this study took several, like hundreds of taxi drivers and hundreds of bus drivers, and they put them in fMRI scanners, and they looked at the size of the hippocampus in the brains. And what happened was taxi drivers had larger hippocampi than bus drivers. The, thing, the difference that they made, uh, if all other things are considered equal, ceteris paribus, the difference was taxi drivers always find their way. They figure it out all day, every day. They literally are in the business of figuring it out. Bus drivers are in the business of doing a repetitive task that never changes. So over time, it physically changes our brain, and we become more accustomed to being creative every day of our lives the more we are. So that's one way to stay creative in the middle of things is by building that habit of creativity every day. Uh, I want to tell you about a research study, and I love this study. It was conducted by Dr. George Land, who I think is the real Santa Claus and probably has the best eyebrows I've ever seen. But uh, he built a study. He did a study, a research study, and he was looking for creative genius. So there are 100 indicators of creativity. He used one called the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking, and he studied people at different ages looking for what percentage of people registered as creative genius. And I love this because he he um, he tested five-year-olds first, and he looked at the five-year-olds, and I I'm just would like you to, like in your head right now, you don't have to write this down, but in your head, just think of what percentage do you believe to be creative genius of five-year-olds? Most people would say 60 or 70. What he found was 98% of five-year-olds scored creative genius on a creativity test. Mind-boggling to me because 2% of people have some cognitive disabilities that they weren't, or physical disabilities that they weren't able to complete the test, which basically tells you every single human by birthright is born as a creative genius. And they do like every single one of us on here right now. 10 year olds, something happened. 32% registered as creative genius. Uh, we usually know what happened as school uh, because 
what happens is we are trained that every question has one right answer and we either get it right or we don't, but that's not the way the world works ever. So uh, he went on with this testing 15 year olds, only 10 and adults less than 2%. It was 1.98% of adults test as creative genius. For the most part, we are afraid to say our ideas. And for most of us, we go back into that warehouse full of knowledge and we find delightful and surprising ideas that really do answer creative challenges. Uh, but we're so afraid to bring those those uh, great words out. We're so afraid that we might be wrong that it inhibits us from scoring as creative genius. Uh, so one of the two other things that happen as creativity goes down over time between birth and retirement, this chart says, uh, two other things go down over time that are in, uh, um, that are, um, pretty much the same. So one is that we stop laughing when we are kids, when we're about five years old, we laugh 300 times a day. As adults, we laugh 17 times a day. That laughter, um, you know, when you think back, uh, you think about a five-year-old laughing at everything. It's like, uh, you know, somebody breaks their leg and they think it's hysterical. Like everything is fun. Everything is funny. Everything is wide open. The other thing that we do over time is we stop asking questions. Our curiosity starts to hurt. Uh, and that's why when we talk about childlike curiosity and childlike um, play and playfulness to be more creative. It, it actually does work because what we're doing isn't being childish. What we're doing is reclaiming bar, uh, the birthright of being a creative genius. And that actually does work. The thing about creativity is it is not inherited. It is not learned. It is unlearned and it is unlearned over time for a few different reasons. The, the, the top reasons for this, uh, number one is education. Number two is that media literally tells us what to think, say, eat, wear, listen to, or read. Uh, and, and marketing really does have our number. As much as I love marketing, I come from that background. Uh, it really does take take a toll. In fact, there are there are businesses that exist to remove thinking from our uh, creative thinking from our vocabulary, uh, such as things that tell us what to wear. There are. Uh, services that will deliver recipes and groceries. And we love these services. There's a service that will tell you what to listen to. There's a service what to, that'll tell you what to watch and what to read. And uh, and they're all out there, including things that will tell us, uh, you know, menswear clothing based on your Spotify data. That's amazing to me. But it, but it really, over time, it, it reduces our ability to think for ourselves. And uh, and over time, our, our neural pathways start to form and they, they form non-creative. Um, this is what you're looking at right now, I think, is uh, is a, a fascinating uh, thing. One is Bloom's taxonomy, which a taxonomy is how hard things are to think of. So if you see at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy there, memory is the simplest thing. That's why most people can just remember things. Creativity is considered the hardest thing for our brain to do. And on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the simplest things to do, of course, breathing, food, water, reproduction, um, those kind of things are simple and everybody can do those. Morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem solving, those are the kind of things that are really hard for our brain to do and for hard for us to wrap around according to Maslow and according to Bloom. With that, I find that interesting though, because if you look at creativity as being so hard in the old economy, like we think agrarian age, the thing about this is we needed lots and lots of people who would say, tell me what to do and I'll do it. I think of like in the in the age of ag agriculture, people showed up at the edge of the field and the farmer said, go out there and pick the ripe corn or go out and pick the right plants. And, and they went out and did it. And, or, or Henry Ford, he built this thing called the assembly line. And people walked in and said, Mr. Ford, sir, what should I do today? And he said, paint these things black and put them, you know, rivet them together. And people did that all day. We needed thousands of people, tens of thousands of people to do those things in the old economy. The future economy and today's economy is an economy of opportunities. It's a very different world that we live in. We don't necessarily need people to work those assembly lines or, you know, we have agriculture robots and we have, I mean, they're still in development, but but a lot of like technical build robots uh, are better than people at building things like cars and cell phones. Uh, but what we need is lots and lots and lots of people who can think at the top echelon of thinking skills. We need lots of people to figure out, like AI is a great example. I believe that we need millions of people to figure out what to do with these opportunities that we have in advancement in technologies. And the more people that we have to do it, and the more people who are willing to say, I'm creative, I'm willing to go into that warehouse, I'm willing to grab creative ideas, and I'm willing to say them out loud, those are the kind of people that are going to take advantage of the future uh, oppor opportunities. Um, with that, though, I, I've come across something that I, I'm working on presently, and that is 
that I'm I'm questioning whether creativity is really the hardest skills. I, I'm kind of going to posit that I think it's the easiest skill. Uh, I think that's why five-year-olds run around and be creative all day, because it's actually something that we do organically and naturally. I think the hardest thinking skills are confidence. I think coming out of that warehouse and shouting at the top of your lungs that you have an idea is the hardest thing for us to do because we're trained from a young age that we're either right or wrong. And some of us, most of us, I am, I am one of them, we are so afraid of being wrong and so afraid of being shut down that we just don't. So uh, with that, I've got some mindsets and uh, I want to do a couple of exercises with that. We have mindsets that we teach in our classes are uh, curiosity, divergent thinking, risk, and resilience, and then tolerating ambiguity. So I'm going to share a little bit about some of these with you, and uh, we have 33 minutes left, so we have plenty of time uh, to do these things. So the first thing I want to show you, though, is how habit is formed, and, and habit of mindset is the most critical thing. So what I'd like you to do, and I'd like you to do this along with me at home because this is it's a really fun exercise, I want you to say out loud, as I show you some numbers, I want you to add them up out loud. And I'm going to start with like 1,000 and 1,040, and I actually want you to add those up as I say it for yourself because you're going to see something really interesting happen. So you just say them out to, out, out to yourself. So it's be like 1,000. 1,040, 2,040, you keep going without me. Almost every single person, and I have done this exercise now for eight years, I've done this with uh, over 2,000 students that I've had in my classrooms, and almost, I, I would say it's probably 99% of people say 5,000 at the end of this. The thing about this is we get into habits, and our brains get into ways of thinking, and our neural pathways are so established that it's really hard to break those habits. Uh, breaking those habits, though, are, it becomes a lot easier with curiosity. To me, curiosity is the entry to creativity. It is the entry to uh, joy in life, and there is some research to back that uh, curiosity actually makes us happier people if we allow ourselves to be curious people. Um, I have some great examples of this, and I think um, one was in Sheboygan, Michigan, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, in Sheboygan, Michigan, I went to a Walmart, so go figure. That's the place to go shopping in Sheboygan. And um, I'm standing in Sheboygan in, in the Walmart, and I look up, and there's this tower of pillows. Uh, and it just occurred to me, I like, I can hear what's happening in the person's brain who made this thing happen is like, what am I going to do with all these pillows? I don't know. They won't fit in the rack. So what do you do? The thing about this is to be curious is to say, I wonder what I could do. I'm curious. I wonder if I could do something to fit more pillows in this display rack. So to me, this is kind of brilliant. I mean, it's ugly, but how brilliant is it? But it started with the curiosity of, I wonder if I could fit something in. To me, that's the magic phrase. And I'd like you to start getting accustomed to using that phrase. I wonder if I could, or I wonder if we could. I'll tell you more about this. Um, we're going to draw something and I'm going to show you what curiosity does and what curiosity doesn't do. So grab your pens and papers and um, I'm actually going to have you draw something. Uh, and I'm gonna, the first drawing that we're going to do, I would like you to do this in five seconds. I know you've never drawn anything in five seconds in your life, and these do not have to be super artistic, but I do want you to play along with me here because this makes the point of how our habits is far formed. So what I'd like you to do is hover your pen across the top of your paper right now, and in five seconds, I'd like you to draw a house go. Five, four, three, two one, and pencils down. Most, almost everybody, which is 99% of people, draw something that vaguely resembles that, which is a rectilinear form with an angled roof on top. And some have chimneys, some have three windows, two windows, some have four windows, uh, usually a door in the front. Um, the, the interesting thing to me is I'll ask people, I, I will straight up ask people how many people have uh, who who live in a house that actually looks like this. And it's usually, I would say it's roughly 5% of people who raise their hand, maybe, maybe a few less, maybe it's like 3% of people who live in the house that they drew. So they drew a house and they know that to be a house, but it's not the house they live in, nor is it the house that they would live in if they could. Uh, and to me, that's not being curious and it's not applying curiosity. And what I'd like you to see now is that curiosity when applied leads you to the creativity that will drive innovation in your future. So what I want you to do right now next is I'm going to give you about, let's say, two, well, one minute. Let's just take one minute. What I'd like you to draw next is I would like you to draw the most creative house 
that has ever been drawn in the history of houses. And I want you to challenge what a house is. I want you to challenge what houses have to be made of. To me, they don't have to be made of wood and, and brick and steel and glass. Uh, they don't have to have shingles as a roof. They, they, all, all housing is, is protection against the elements. So I want you to draw a house, uh, the most creative house that's ever been drawn. Please do not draw a pineapple under the sea because we've seen that one before way too many times. But draw the most creative house that's ever been drawn and um, we'll touch back in one minute. And I'll draw along with you, by the way. About 30 more seconds here. All right, let's wrap that up. And um, and what I drew, uh, I drew something that challenges that. I, I have a movable house here that, of course, has uh, water because uh, boats are my thing. So I'm, uh, I have something built on water, and I hope that you have something interesting as well, probably something that serves you better than uh, a house that you would go out and buy. So with that, what I want to say is uh, this is this is the most um, – interesting thing, the in, the most interesting part of this to me is everybody draws something a little bit different and everything a little bit more personal. So I say boats are my thing. I draw something about boats. Uh, most of my students at 17, they will draw a slide involved. They will they will draw, uh, you know, playrooms. I had one uh, last week who had uh, four stories. And on the fourth floor, there was a never ending Coldplay concert, which I'm fascinated by. I love what students do. Uh, and I'm never Never, uh, it's never a dull moment in the classroom. So what I want you to do next is um, I'd like you to capture a couple things that you are dealing with right now. Maybe one thing that you are dealing with very specifically. Anything that you're dealing with at work, yes, that's great too. Anything you are dealing with at home, that's great too. So I'd like you to just capture maybe one thing that you're dealing with or two to three things that you are dealing with. Uh, and those, again, they don't need to be shared with anybody. So if they're personal, rock on with that. And if they're uh, public things, that's, that's great too. So just capture something because what I want you to see about this and why this is so important is that we apply this thing to everything you do in life. And when you apply creative skills to everything you do in life, it changes how we approach things. So as I say in classrooms, it's like, I don't teach people what to do. I, I teach people how to do it better. No matter what they do. I can I can show people that applying creativity skills really does change the way that you approach the tasks that you do, and uh, allows you to do things with more uh, with more more depthly, more creatively, and more surprising and delightfully, thereby creating an advantage for yourself, uh, like the cell phone companies did. Um, with curiosity, I want to show you something really interesting. I love this story because it's it's from real life, not from uh, academia. And uh, this was at a, a 
my wife has an annual picnic with her employees. And a few years back, uh, one of her employees, Mary, brought her kids. And uh, she brought some kids. And this kid right here with the uh, with the glasses on, the orange shorts, he came along. And this was at a little park right outside of greater Cincinnati, uh, right overlooking downtown in an, an area of uh, close to downtown. And at this little park, this guy comes up to me and he's running around and he comes up to me with that cup. And he looks up at me and he says, there's lizards. I wonder if I could catch them. And I looked down at him and I said, probably can. And, and he turns around and phew, like in the cartoons, he runs away. Uh, and I watched this guy and this is precious to me because I captured this in awe. And I was in awe of, I watched him for the next four hours of his life, maybe six, four hours at least of his life. I've never seen somebody more happy in, in my life. I've never seen somebody more happy than this guy running around with that cup, trying to catch lizards. And, and there's little lizards in Cincinnati. They were from Spain originally. The Lazarus family brought them back from a vacation. That's a different story. But but the thing about this is, and why I'm so like awed of this story, is what he said to me, and this is critical. He said, there's lizards. I wonder if I can catch them. That's it. I wonder if I can catch them. What his curiosity was, yes, he was curious about the lizards. He wanted to touch one. He wanted to see what it was made of and that sort of thing. But what he really wondered is his own performance. And the minute we are curious about our own performance, it changes the dynamic of how we go about everything in life. I wonder if I could get that client. I wonder if I could get that client back that we lost. I wonder if I could have a better relationship. I wonder if I could make my wife happier. I wonder what I could make for dinner. Every single thing that we wonder about our own performance changes the way that we approach things. And if we know how we can do things, it doesn't change the way that we go about it. And we go about it with complete medi mediocrity, never aspiring to next level. Creativity can change the balance and the direction of, of how we go about our work. Um, I liken this to, uh, to uh, Edison and not Edison. And the thing about Edison, uh, this story that everybody knows, uh, by the way, I wonder if you could on your the thing that you captured, I'd like you to write a I wonder if statement or I wonder if I could statement as I'm talking here. But this uh, Edison thing, and everybody knows that story and that old adage of we 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 didn't um, uh, let's see, we didn't succeed we or we didn't fail. we we had uh, whatever ten thousand shots on goal of making light bulbs. Uh, and I love that story because what they did was, probably Tesla, maybe Edison, one of them went into the lab at Edison Labs. I mean, Edison was a, a businessman and Tesla was really a tech guy. But one of them at one point took two, an anode and a cathode, and they snapped the wires together and this electricity thing made light. And they were fascinated by that. One of them said, I wonder if we could use this electricity stuff to make light. And the minute they say, I wonder if we could, they started on this path, 10,000 failures to try to get to something until finally, over time, they took the anode and the cathode and they put a filament across it and they realized it was oxidizing and oxidation is rust. But when you add electricity to the mix, it rusts like that. So they uh, they ended up, one of them put a bell jar over the whole assembly and they took the anode and the cathode and the filament. And when they pulled all the oxygen out, it didn't rust and thereby the wire last longer. That's how they made light bulbs. But to me, there's no instruction manuals to make light bulbs when you start doing that. There's no instruction to anything in life. But when you go at it, you say, I wonder if I could, it changes the way you go about it. And you're willing to fail 10,000 times to make something happen. Uh, and they did fail 10,000 times famously with, you know, they tried gold and silver and hair and all kinds of things before they found uh, the oxidation uh, oxidation problem. And so that was probably Tesla. And and I'm not going to have that argument. I, a lot of my students like to have that argument, but I, I don't. I, I believe it was Tesla, but we'll just go with that. So I do want you to do that. I want you to take whatever you had written on uh, your paper that you said you were dealing with. I'd like you to restate those things into, I wonder if I could, or I wonder if we could. And please take a, a minute to do that because it's a practical application of what I do. Uh, and I, I would like to remind myself to do that every day. And I'm reminding you to do it right now because it's uh, it's incredibly powerful. So please restate that. Um, I'm going to move on to the next uh, mindset. And I love this one. It's called divergent thinking. I'll get out of the way of the text over there. But uh, I want to show you how this works and how our brain thinks of ideas when we tell our brain to come up with multiple ideas. So divergent thinking, the word divergent means to come up with many or diverge, go many different ways. Uh, converging 
is to, and from many, to choose one. So diverging is to choose many directions. Converging is to choose one. Ideation, or divergent thinking, happens when we pose ourselves a problem. So I might say, I wonder if I might be able to do something. And then I said, well, how might I be able to do that? How might I? Changes the way I think. And all of a sudden, I start coming up with ideas. When I do that, I come up with some ideas represented by the yellow di uh, yellow stars up here. The thing, uh, one piece of research found was that across the world, um, regardless of where you live, regardless of your you know, gender, makeup, religion, race, nothing else matters. The first half a dozen to 10 ideas are the same no matter where you are on earth. And this was done with a, a thing called the... Um, it was called the the multiple uses test, and it was you know what might be all the ways you could use a brick, or what might be all the things you could use a paperclip for. Across the world, the first ten ideas were all the same. So for a paperclip, it was jewelry, a tool, a weapon, a toy. I mean, it was all the same first ideas. After that, something happens, and when you come up with ideas, all of a sudden, the more ideas you come up with, the more what they call outside the box they get. Um, for this, we call this in, in research, we call that the area of discovery versus the area of famili familiarity. Uh, and by the way, when we talk about outside the box thinking, this is literally where the word outside the box came from. You're looking at the box. It's called the creative diamond. But with that, the more you're, the, what, what this shows is that the more ideas you come up with, the more creative ideas you have. And it's and it happens and it works 100% of the time. That's what divergent thinking does. The more ideas you have, the more ideas you come up with. Why that happens is because we technically, what happens is we run out of first right ideas. And I always like to say this, when we run out of ideas, that's when creative ideas start because we're, we're literally done with, with non-creative ideas and we go back into that warehouse of ideas or, or of knowledge and we walk down aisles that we would never have walked down before and we come out with more creative ideas because we have exhausted the ones that are in the box that we know to be true we start looking for other ones. Same thing as Edison and, and uh, Tesla when they were looking for ways to make the light bulb work. They ran out of ideas. They scratched their head and they tried a completely different direction down a different aisle in the warehouse, which was what's happening with the metal instead of which type of metal should we use for a filament in a light bulb. So divergent thinking is affording the first right ideas so creative ideas can be discovered. And I'd like you to please remember that because the minute you think you're out of ideas, you're not out of ideas. Humans don't run out of ideas. Humans, uh, humans think they're out of ideas. They never run out of ideas. So I want to tell you where this came from and why this uh, is such a cool thing. Uh, it's, it's called brainstorming. So true story, Alex Osborne was, uh, he was a advertising executive. He owned a company called BBDO. He was the owner of uh, the O in BBDO. They're still in business in New York, by the way. And he, he noticed something really fascinating. He noted he noted that while they were building advertisements in his company, there were only a few people that came up with great ideas. And there were a lot of people who came up with mediocre ideas. So he said at one point, uh, I wonder, he said, and, and this is in his memoir, he says, I wonder, uh, I wondered to myself how these people are different. And if I watched them work, if they worked differently, so I could teach everyone to work like they did. Well, he did. He watched them. And what he found was that at, uh, in the... In the afternoon, they wrote all their ideas on paper and they neatly left them on their desks, according to him. He, they were orderly in, in uh, his business. And the next morning they would come and they would look at all those ideas and they would choose the most creative of them. Well, you know, it was just past World War II, 1948, 1950s. And he called this thing brainstorming when they came up with lots of ideas. And uh, because it sounded like, you know, war and it sounded like army, brainstorming had a good word to it. And he started selling that. And it was a trademark at one point. It was his BBDO owned the word brainstorming and, and it took off. Uh, but with that, he had some ideas of rules to follow with it. And he said, you know, seek the crazy ideas because crazy ideas always turned out to be the best ones. Uh, go for quantity because of the fact that that creative diamond I just showed you. Build on the ideas of other people. So it other people, when they say their ideas, it takes you down different rows of the, of the warehouse. And also don't judge them until later. The thing is, there are tons of bad ideas. Don't ever think they're not bad ideas in brainstorming. There are lots of bad ideas. It's just that you don't judge them in the moment. I only have one rule of brainstorming, and I teach this with my students, and that is 
Stop talking about it and make up ideas. What we do in the real life is we all sit together and we talk ourselves out of every good idea we've ever had because we're humans. And we also talk each other out of each other's good ideas because that's what we do. So uh, I, typically we write challenge questions and we write them in a very specific word wording uh, so that it forces our brain into different ways of thinking. Uh, if I say, uh, you know, if I say the words, what might be all the ways or how might we, it literally forces me down different aisles of my warehouse. So if I say what might be all the ways, that tells my brain, don't go just down the one aisle in my warehouse, go through every aisle in the warehouse and see what else is out there. And, and it works all the, it works 100% of the time because it forces our brain in a different way. Um, I have a sample question and you can do this like, I, with me, I'm hoping if we have a chat window open, I'd like you to type, type into it. But typically what happens is if I say, how am I going to get to work today? Hey, how, how am I going to get to work today? Or how can I get to work today? The first thing every single person in the world says is drive your car. I mean, that's pretty simple. Drive. Like that's how you get to work every day. That's our normal way of thinking. If you're urban, you say take the subway or walk if you're you know in a, in a small town urban. But for the most part, people say drive your car. Now, if I say, and I am saying, what might be all the ways I could get to work today? So type a few ideas into that box, into the chat window right now, or come up with a few uh, while I'm talking, and I'll, I'll buy you another 30 seconds to write a couple of things down. But what happens, I want you to see here, is it literally changes the way we think when I say what might be all the ways I could get to work today. It tells your brain also, you're not done after two or three ideas. What might be all the ways? And there are millions. In fact, endless. There are infinite ways that I could get to work today. Uh, and I'd like you to write down a few of them, uh, a few of the more creative ones, actually just until you have exhausted the normal ways of getting there, which would be, I'd like you to exhaust car, subway, exhaust walking, exhaust Uber, exhaust bicycles, and then start to move into creative ways. And when you do that, you will so start to show yourself just how creative you are. It's inevitable. It works literally 100% of the time. Brainstorming literally works 100% of the time if we follow the rules. If we don't follow the rules, it doesn't work. My rules are simple. Judge the ideas later. Come up with as many as you can. And don't try to talk each other out of it. And don't decide which is the best idea until you're done exhausting your time not your ideas. Once that happens, it changes everything. So I'm hoping there's a few ideas in the chat window right now, and I'll, I'll tell you what happens uh, in this. Uh, I've done this exercise enough to see a few different ideas, so I wrote a few things down. Typically, how can I get home? Yields one answer, drive. Uh, what might be all the ways? Things like, yes, drive, and then we get into you know hot air balloons, ride an emu, unicycle, uh, disco walk, alien abduction, like all kinds of things. My hope is that you came up with some that are even more creative than the ones that are on here. Uh, and, and I love that because every single person brings something to them. I told you I was into boats before. Yeah, that's something I think of right away. We, great. Let's build a giant dam so I could, you know, kayak into work or, or uh, you know, drive my boat. So that does work. I want to give you one more chance, uh, one more thing to do on this. And um, I have another few minutes of this. And, and I want to give you this sample ch challenge here. Uh, and that is we all get texts or we all get asked normal things every day. And our tendency in autopilot, it's called autonomic thinking. Autonomic means we don't think about it. It's literally in the back of our, our, our brain. What happens is we answer questions the way that we believe the asking party wants to be answered. So that's why I liken the way we think, like we hate thinking, but the way we think is almost like a, like a survey. Surveys are lip service because we answer surveys in the way in which them, in the manner of the way that we which we believe the asking party wants to be answered. So when we have a text, and this is a good text in here, somebody says, hey, you react, hey. Somebody on the street says, hi, hi. Uh, we say, how are you? Fine. Those are the autonomic ways of thinking. What I'd like you to do right now and forevermore is to think of several different ways to do things. So this is a great example of divergent thinking is uh, I had a student that I ran this challenge with and my student came back to me about a month, maybe two months later at the end of the semester, maybe three months later. And he says, I'm in. He gets real excited. I, I literally put his picture on here because he included this video in a video that he sent to afterwards. He said, uh, I mean, you won't believe this. He said his girlfriend lives in Columbus. He lives in Oxford and, uh, and they have been texting for, you know, two years or they've been dating or whatever it was. And, and he said, this challenge changed our relationship altogether. 
So we're struggling as a long distance relationship. And this challenge, they took it on that every single text, they reconsidered how they were going to text. And what it did was 100% this will make a person more interesting to talk to, more fun to talk to, more interesting of a person. The way that you answer every single question, if you answer in a manner that is unexpected, it will surprise, delight, and elate the party who's asking. So you can actually make people happy and change their brain chemistry through answering a text. What I'd like you to do with that right now is think of five ways how you might answer a text. So if somebody texts you, hey, then how might you answer that? I'd like you to think of that because if I gave you something, it wouldn't be creative at all. But I'd like you to get into the habit of that because that literally makes us more interesting people. The way that we answer texts matter. The way that we answer simple questions matters. And all of that does uh, add up to a lot, of, um, a lot of fun for people. So I look at this. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm going to leave a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to actually leave a few minutes for uh, questions of this. We wrap up in nine minutes. And, um, and I want to leave just a few minutes uh, where we can get maybe, uh, JJ, if you could come back on here and we can... Um, let me see if I can stop. Did I stop sharing already? Yeah, you're good, David. Thank you so much. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. All right. Awesome. And thank you all for participating. We had a lot of great uh, comments in the chat. I know you were awesome. going after it, but they said a lot of uh, of what you predicted they would. And we had some, we had some uh, um, creative ways to get to work, including a hot air balloon and a kite board so, and a hovercraft and a jet ski. So that's good. Um, well, maybe that'll be my next investment. Maybe I need a jet ski next. Yeah, I think that might be hard uh, without water, but um, okay. you can make it work. All right, so let's have some questions. And now's a good time, obviously, to put in questions. You can use the comment or the ask a question button below your video. And we'll take a few minutes to get to some of these. Thank you to those of you that submitted them ahead of time. I have a couple of those ready. So we'll start with that from Janice. She says, how to reignite your long lost creativity. Maybe you gave some answers for that, but if you want yeah. to expand on that. Well, I think uh, for me, it's a matter of forming those mindsets. Uh, inevitably, the more we, the more creative we are on a regular basis, the more creative we are on a regular basis. And it's a cycle uh, that the thing about that is we have to overcome that fear. 100% uh, of what stops us from that creative genius is being afraid that our ideas may not measure up to other people's standards. Uh, we have to be willing. That's the number one thing. We have to be willing to fail at something to be creative. Uh, and if we're not willing to fail, if we're not really willing to be wrong, we can never do anything in our, uh, creative in our lives. So even if you think about an artist and I think about, oh, I thought about this last night, literally while I was watching uh, Taylor Swift at uh, at the Super Bowl and I was watching um Usher and a few other performers. The thing about this is you have to be willing to do something that might fail to be able to make the next hit. Artists do this with every painting they do or every sculpture they do and, and every song that they sing. They have to be willing to say, this may not be a hit, but I'm going to make it anyway. Uh, and maybe it is a hit, maybe it's not a hit, but they have to be willing to put things out there. Otherwise, there's a one, you're a one hit wonder and, and then we're done. Uh, and I think that happens. We were one hit wonders when we were children, but to get that back, we have to be resilient enough to know that not everything we do is going to be perfect uh, and be willing to go at it. That's it. Great advice. Thank you. Another one from Stacy. How do you find your creativity when your brain feels drained from a daily to-do list? Oh man, uh, Stacy, thank you for that one because that's like that's my every day. Uh, basically, I kind of get lost in things and I immerse myself all the time. And I think we're we are fried at the end of the day. Uh, typically, there's this thing called incubation where we we can put up challenge in our head and we can go think of something completely different for a little while and then come back to it. So our bodies do need rest, our our brains do need rest. But what we find that I think is more interesting than anything is our subconscious doesn't. Uh, that's why we dream at night. So sometimes uh, sometimes I'll put a challenge in my head at night and I'll wake up and look at it again in the morning. And then the, in the, in, at night, something actually happened. Uh, and to me, that does uh, it does take over. The other thing to do is to be inspired by something is to catch on. So I will do, um, and I do like little doodles all the time just because I come from a design background, but it can be the same thing with like, I'll do it in PowerPoint is the minute I put something down that is creative and I force myself to do the first five minutes of it, all of a sudden I'm lost in time and space. 
I think I'm tired. I think I'm exhausted, but I got five minutes in and all of a sudden it's two o'clock in the morning and, uh, and I'm having a ball with it. Oh, JJ, I lost your voice again. That's because I went on mute. I'm going to take the blame this time and not blame it on my tools like the start. Um, we have a question from Nicole. How can this information help new leaders, CEOs, managers in the workplace develop creativity on their teams? Yeah, Nicole, that, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Um, and I oftentimes I liken, uh, I believe that, synon that, that leadership and creativity are synonyms. Uh, and if you look at what leaders do for a living is they create vision. That's it. They, they create a vision for a better tomorrow. That's why people will rally behind them and they will be the leader. So I look at that as a synonym. How can leaders uh, affect other people's? Number one, they can allow things to be, uh, they can allow for potential failures. They can allow people to be wrong occasionally without cutting people down and breaking people down. So the thing that stops most people is a lot of leaders are, are, are um, like if, if somebody makes a mistake, they really drill it in. But the more understanding we are that not everything is a perfect idea at its birth, the more uh, able our employees are. So I have some other tools that I like to use with that that are um, tools of an innovation environment or, or a, like an environment where in innovation can happen. And the biggest, the number one tool in there is from leadership. How do we provide that thing called psychological safety, which allows our people to feel like they can contribute ideas? And if their ideas aren't perfect at birth, that those ideas can be developed into something interesting. And if not, those people are challenged to like, OK, fine. So if that didn't work, let's try something else. Great. Yeah, I think that I could do another workshop on that one. I love that. That, one. that culture uh, that, that you develop is yeah. huge. Um, Okay, uh, quick one. Kathleen asked, will the slides be available to us? Um, is that something that we can share? I mean, the video, the recording sure. will also be available too, yeah, and sure. the slides too. Yeah. Um, and then Bon asked, what was the text, if you could go back to, that you were suggesting we uh, provide five ideas how to answer? So I think oh. the second to last exercise. Yeah, any text that. you get. I, 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 I like to use one typically that's like, hey, I'm running late for a meeting or uh, how are you? Like that's a text where people are actually, this is, this is the best one because how are you means they want to initiate a conversation, but don't know what to say. And our creativity provides them with the safety that says, okay, I'm going to throw something back, maybe a little bit playful. Uh, like, because what I know that they want is they, to initiate a conversation and basically they want to get together or something they want to talk. Uh, in which case I can say something that would provide them the next level of, like, I'm going to make you happy by giving you freedom to say anything. And I'm going to say it in a playful way to inspire you to say things in a playful way. Yeah, it reminds me of um, one more yeah. thing on that. And then I really will uh, stop here. But uh, I like to in workshops, I love to take little labels and I love to have people make labels that go on the back of their cell phones that just say five ideas so that they remember every single text they get. Come up with five ideas. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it reminds me of what you learn about improv, where you don't want to end a conversation, right? Yes, and, and keep it going. Cool. Uh, and then one last thing, David. Um, Drew asked about your uh, post-it notes. I don't know if you explained oh, if you. Explained I did that. not, um, but I will tell you that I am closing in. Uh, I have been making an effort for the past five years to collect one million ideas on post-it notes, and we are closing in on that because our students, uh, we run 100,000 a year, uh, maybe more, maybe 200,000 a year just in my classes and another couple hundred thousand in other classes around. So last uh, last year, we talked to 3M a little bit and they provided us, They, I have boxes of new ones. They sent us, uh, I wanna say a half a million unused brand new post-its just to say thank you. So I am collecting a million. If you have some with ideas on them, bring them in. My office is always open. Yeah, sounds good. Well, thank you so much, David. You um, have been so uh, good to our division and, and on campus staying connected and um, sharing uh, your expertise, and it's always enjoyable. So we really appreciate your time and um, what, you've, what you've shared in this, this segment. Again, for those of you watching at home, we'd love if you participated in more of our Winter College Week. Um, there's a wine tasting tonight at seven. You can still get the wines or follow along. Very uh, informative, even if you're you're not drinking the wines. 
We have lectures from alumni or professors all week at noon. And then Friday, we'll celebrate Charter Day with a bourbon tasting and our advancement awards. So we hope you'll uh, follow along with us the rest of the week. David, once again, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and uh, love and honor. Thank you. Love and honor.